Venezuela's National Electoral Council presented the technological platform to be used in the upcoming December 6 parliamentary elections. The Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, has announced the intention to create a Commission on Presidential Capacity to evaluate the President's health in a time of crisis. Authorities in Kurdistan declared a state of emergency in the capital Bishkek on Friday in order to control the deteriorating political crisis. From, from the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. And we begin in Venezuela where the National Electoral Council presented the technological platform to be used in the upcoming parliamentary elections set for December 6. The president of the National Electoral Council, Indira Alfonso, presented the electoral machines to the political organisations contesting the elections this Friday. She noted that the machines fulfilled the technological data to guarantee the transparency of the electoral process, adding that biosecurity protocols would be observed for their use in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Since 2017, the renovation of the technological platform has been debated. And today we can say that in the face of the historical, political, social and economic context of our country, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and the fight against it, the conditions and guarantees are in place to show you the technological advances which will assure a transparent, safe, trustworthy election as demanded by the electoral process to which we have convened you for December 6. Bolivian political analyst and expert on electoral processes Juan Carlos Pinto has noted that all the polls conducted so far have showed the movement towards socialism as the favourite in the lead up to the October 18th general elections. Polls have been published for seven or eight months now, all of which show the mass as a winner, which has polled around eight or nine points ahead of the second position. From this perspective, the Bolivian people are seeking to recover the quality of the vote, the possibility of voting and deciding on October 18th, and the numbers are favoring the mass. Likewise, the political analysts commented on new plans by the Bolivian de facto regime to prevent the movement towards socialism's presidential candidate, Luis Arce, from winning the elections. Paid with this situation, the mass IPSP is far ahead in terms of electoral issues. There are other kinds of strategy by the coup plotters in particular which are sparking concern among the population which supports democracy. We are talking about the preparations and statements voiced by Minister Murillo, which given the possibility of victory for the mass, represent a veiled threat. And the analyst also warned of the mobilization of troops by the Bolivian de facto government under the pretext of alleged military drills in the Chapari region. There is an initial mobilization of troops set for October 12th, a joint exercise of the armed forces in the Chapari area for which armaments are being moved. Likewise, paramilitary groups are present in cities across the country in order to spark or trigger violence, as one of the propositions of the current government is precisely that violence will be promoted by the mass and the government will have to step in as the defender of democracy. That's the prospect that we are currently experiencing. And Bolivia's popular communication network has leaked information detailing a joint plan between the Bolivian de facto regime and coup plotting military officials aimed at suspending the general elections. According to the document, the de facto government of Janine Agnes and the military high command are planning violent acts before and during the electoral process. The plan would consist of creating false positives using explosive devices placed in the facilities used to host foreign electoral observers to thus incriminate the movement towards socialism. Likewise, the plan would also be supported by media outlets linked to the Agnes government. The president of Ecuador's National Electoral Council, Diana Atamant, confirmed on Friday that the European Union will participate as an observer in the general election schedule for February 2021. 
The announcement was made after a meeting at the institution's headquarters with the ambassador of the regional bloc to Ecuador, Charles Mitchell Gertz. According to the electoral official, observers will visit the country as a reinforced team of electoral experts. Meanwhile, Ambassador Gertz stressed the importance of strengthening the democratic process in Ecuador and emphasized that the team of observers will be independent. In addition to the European Union, observation support is expected from other international bodies, including the Inter-American Union of Electoral Organizations and the Association of World Election Bodies. In Colombia, social organizations denounced the assassination of indigenous leader Eluquio Pascal Rodriguez this Friday. Rodriguez belonged to the High Guard of the La Brava Indigenous Reservation, located in a rural area of the municipality of Tumaco in the state of Nariño. According to the Institute for Development and Peace Studies, the victim arrived at his home around 7 a.m. local time, where armed men were waiting for him and gunned him down. The assassination of the indigenous leader is the 225th murder of a social leader in Colombia so far this year. Human rights defenders have highlighted that during the course of this year, 66 massacres have been committed in the country, of which 15 took place in the department of Antioquia. Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez addressed a ministerial meeting of the Non-Aligned Movement this Friday. The meeting was mostly held virtually, as has happened with several United Nations events due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The meeting focused on the theme of a more relevant, united and effective movement against emerging global challenges, including COVID-19, to mark the 65th anniversary of the adoption of the Non-Aligned Movement's founding principles. On addressing the meeting, the Cuban Foreign Minister endorsed the role of the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization and stressed the importance of international solidarity and collaboration. He also noted that Cuba is proud to have modestly contributed to these efforts, despite the U.S. blockade and the U.S. campaign against Cuba's internationalist medical cooperation. Speaker of the United States House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi held a press conference this Friday announcing the House intention to create a commission on presidential capacity that would exist to evaluate the health of the president in a time of crisis. Pelosi announced that the House will invoke the 25th Amendment, which gives Congress some power to evaluate the health and stability of the president to conduct the duties of the office and create a commission to assess whether a transition of power to the vice president would be suitable. Pelosi argued there were indications that President Donald Trump has an altered state of mind from COVID-19 and his subsequent treatment. She noted that Trump has bragged about the medication that he's taken and there are articles by medical professionals saying it could have an impact on his judgment. However, as Congress is not currently in a legislative session, a commission cannot realistically exist for the rest of the year. Nonetheless, U.S. Representative Jaime Raskin, speaking with Pelosi at the press conference, defended introducing the legislation now, arguing that the pandemic has highlighted Congress's need to set up an institution that can evaluate the health of the president in extreme circumstances. Europe has recorded over 100,000 daily coronavirus cases for the first time. The continent reached a critical figure on Thursday after a steady rise in cases over the past week. The United Kingdom, Russia, Spain and France have reported over 10,000 cases each in the last three days. Meanwhile, daily infections in Italy have topped 5,000 for the first time since March. Spain has declared a state of emergency to keep Madrid in partial lockdown measures for a fortnight after 63 people died from COVID-19 in the region in the last week. And Poland has reported a record daily rise in infections for the fourth day in a row. The country recorded over 4,700 new cases on Friday, ahead of masks becoming mandatory in all public places from Saturday, while a tightening of measures in schools is also expected to be announced. Spain's government declared a state of emergency in and around the capital, Madrid, on Friday to enforce a partial lockdown to curb rampant virus infections, overriding opposition from the regional authorities. The decision comes as Madrid is experiencing a surge in COVID-19 cases. Spain reported nearly 5,600 new cases in the last 24 hours, for a total of more than 880,000. The country's COVID-19 death toll is one of the highest in the continent, at more than 32,000. The Spanish health minister stressed that measures must be taken to protect the health of the people of Madrid and to prevent the further spread of the coronavirus to other regions of the country. Hundreds of thousands of vulnerable people living in coronavirus hotspots in the United Kingdom could be told to isolate this winter under government plans in the face of soaring infections. The plans reportedly being considered by the British government would take a terrible toll on people living alone and particularly on those with mental health issues. The government says it's business as usual for NHS mental health services, but charities say there isn't enough support.
Some local groups are so concerned about the effects of loneliness during the pandemic that they're taken to the streets to offer their support directly to members of the public in need. Very, very clear is the government that uh, the NHS and all its mental health services are absolutely open for business and people should be taking advantage of that. The response was so great when we put the appeal out. Yeah. What I didn't expect was so many people coming to us saying they, they didn't know they could talk to people, there's no one they could talk to. It's really, really lovely like knowing that like, you can go and speak to people like that yeah. and you can go to groups. It's yeah. really nice if you're in a bad place. German authorities continue to express concern over the rapid increase of COVID-19 infections in recent days and have urged citizens to comply with health measures. The country has reported over 4,400 new cases in the last 24 hours, for a total of more than 316,000 confirmed infections. We want and must together prevent a lockdown. I think this is our common demand, not only for economic reasons. It will be dramatic for the German economy if this happens again, but also for social reasons. In this context, I once again make an urgent appeal to the 24-year-old community in big cities to understand that this is not a time for partying, not a time for negligence, but it is a time to protect others, especially the elderly, and prevent the number of infections from exploding. After the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the United Nations World Food Programme with this year's Nobel Peace Prize, the executive director of the humanitarian organisation, David Beasley, stressed that the award is a call to action to end hunger around the world. Well, to me personally, uh, and to WFP, it's a call to action because I believe that the, that the Nobel Peace Prize Committee recognises that hunger is a driving cause of conflict and literally so many people around the world are on the brink of starvation. It's a call to action. It's a call to action to our donors around the world, to the billionaires who are making billions off of COVID. It's a call to action to not let anyone die from starvation. It's a call to action that we've got to save and help our, our friends, our brothers, our sisters around the world. With all the wealth in the world today, no one should go to bed hungry, much less starve to death. Authorities in Kurdistan declared a state of emergency in the capital, Bishkek, on Friday in order to control the deteriorating political crisis following days of social unrest sparked by the October 4th parliamentary election results. The announcement was made by President Sorenbay Shinbekov, who noted that the state of emergency would be in place until o October 21st. Meanwhile, troops and military equipment will be deployed in order to establish checkpoints, prevent armed clashes, ensure public order and the protection of the civilian population. Protesters took to the streets following the elections, demanding the annulment of the result, which was granted, while also freeing prisoners. Among them, opposition leader Saida Japarov, who was appointed Prime Minister. Dear compatriots, due to the excessive ambitions of some politicians, the peaceful life of our citizens and the tranquility in our country are jeopardized. Along with political ones, there have been provocative calls undermining the unity of the country and the peaceful life of society. Kyrgyzstan is a danger line. The Kyrgyzstanis, the peaceful life of our citizens mustn't be sacrificed to political passions. That's why the state of emergency has been imposed in the capital of the country, Bishkek. Today I have signed an appropriate order. Under my constitutional authority, I will do everything to save the peaceful life of citizens and the integrity of the country. This Friday, Armenia and Azerbaijan began their first high-level talks after nearly two weeks of clashes over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. The Russian president extended the invitation to host the talks after holding conference calls with the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Alijev, and Prime Minister of Armenia, Nikol Pahinian, on Thursday. The Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, is mediating these high-level talks between the Azerbaijani and Armenian foreign ministers. The main objective is to negotiate an end to hostilities for humanitarian reasons, an exchange of prisoners and the handing over of the bodies of those who have been killed in enemy territory during the armed conflict. Syria and Russia concluded a new round of talks this Thursday as part of joint efforts to consolidate and expand bilateral cooperation in all fields. The ongoing cooperation is aimed at mitigating the impact of Western sanctions on the Arab country. Our correspondent Hisham Wanas has the story. The bilateral talks that took place in Moscow addressed the necessary steps to start bilateral cooperation plans in the sector of trade, agriculture, industry, energy, transportation and water resources, as well as the need to boost trade between Syria and Russia. 
The Russian military and political support to Syria has been vital and now we are working on expanding the Syrian-Russian alliance, which is being consolidated at the economic level through meetings to launch the bilateral cooperation projects in all other areas of the oil industry, health, technology and electricity, as well as in the field of hydroelectric power plants. At the same time, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad announced the interest of Damascus in requesting Moscow the supply of the vaccine against COVID-19. The purpose of this exchange is also to address the basic needs of the Syrian people. And to do that, they are studying ways to challenge the Western economic blockade imposed to Syria. In these circumstances, anyone is interested in receiving the vaccine against this dangerous virus. But I believe that it is not currently av available in the world market and we will discuss the matter with the Russian authorities, so that once it's available, we get it for our people, a matter that we consider very important. During the first days of last September, an official Russian delegation signed an agreement with the Syrian authorities in Damascus that included more than 40 new projects in the field of reconstruction of the energy sector, a number of hydroelectric power centers, and oil extraction in the sea. This agreement is an important achievement in the field of economic cooperation that both countries consider essential to consolidate their firm political and military alliance. The Syrian Ministry of Health reported 62 new COVID-19 cases on Friday, taking the total to over 4,500 confirmed infections since the first case was detected on March 22nd. Just over 1,200 patients have recovered from the virus, while the death toll rose to 215 of the three new fatalities reported in the past day. Syria maintains restrictive measures at workplaces, commercial centres, service centres and religious institutions in order to curb the spread of the virus. Special measures were also adopted in the elementary, secondary and higher education levels as classes resumed. This Friday, Sophie Petronin, an elderly French aid worker, was released from captivity alongside a top Malian politician after having been presumably held hostage by jihadists since 2016. The two landed in the Malian capital, Bamako, for an emotional reunion with their loved ones. I'm doing much better. I thank the Malian authorities for all they have done. The French government, who apparently also helped. I spent almost a quarter of a century in the north of this country to take care of the children, malnutrition. I would like to thank my colleagues again. Luckily, my greatest joy today is to know that my assistant was able to continue the war without me. So, for Mali, I will pray and implore the blessing and mercy of Allah, because I'm a Muslim. You say Sophie, but it's Marian that you have in front of you. In Tunisia, government authorities have decided to re-establish a curfew in the greater metropolitan area of Tunis for 15 days to try to limit the spread of COVID-19. In the upcoming fortnight, traffic will be prohibited from 9pm to 5am during the week and from 7pm to 5am on weekends. The decision was taken following a significant increase in the number of coronavirus cases over the past week. Tunisian health authorities warned that hospitals were struggling to cope with an influx of COVID-19 patients and urged residents to respect health measures. To date, the North African country has confirmed nearly 27,000 COVID-19 cases and over 400 deaths. China, which has at least four coronavirus vaccine candidates in the last stage of clinical trials, announced Friday that it's joining the global COVID-19 vaccine allowance, known as COVAX. The country signed an agreement with Gavi, the co-leader of the alliance with the World Health Organization, which welcomed the move. We are taking this concrete step to ensure equitable distribution of vaccine, especially to developing countries, and hope more capable countries will also join and support COVAX. As far as I know, quite a lot of Chinese vaccine developers have expressed willingness to join COVAX. The experts of both parties are in communication on vaccine R&D, approval, supervision, and technical standards. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.